In this video, we'll look at the end of the war in 1865, where uh, the last video lost, uh, left off was with the election of 1864, which Lincoln won handily over George McClellan. Well, in March uh, 1865, March 4th, Lincoln gave his second inaugural address, which is very, very famous. Here you can see a picture of him uh, on the eastern side of the Capitol on the stage they built, and your little arrow points to Lincoln standing there. You can barely see him. At just 700 words, it was one of the shortest in uh, history. Lincoln never mentioned the Confederacy, which was a legal tactic that had much to do with Reconstruction, which we'll talk about in uh, subsequent videos. He did, however, work to calm tensions and set the stage for reunion. It included the famous quote, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations." Unquote. Very famous. Here's a picture of the crowd outside. By the spring of 1865, Lee knew that he couldn't hold Petersburg anymore, and so on April 2nd, 1865, he notified Jefferson Davis that he was going to have to abandon Petersburg, which meant that Richmond would fall. Jefferson Davis and his cabinet took what they could of the Confederate records and the Treasury, what was valuable, and fled southward. Uh, first they fled west to get around Grant's army, then they fled southward. The U.S. offered a huge reward for the apprehension and capture of Davis, $100,000. Imagine how much that was worth back then. Here's a picture of the evacuation of Richmond. Chaos prevailed as, you know, mobs roamed the city and fires broke out and looting prevailed. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia began a, a quick retreat westward from the Richmond-Petersburg area before finally being cornered by Grant's forces at the small Appomattox Courthouse community. Union forces quickly occupied Richmond. You can note here the U.S. flag that's flying over the destroyed capital. You can see how, how destroyed Richmond was in this photograph. Lincoln decided that he wanted to go inspect Richmond, and all the advisors are saying, don't go. But Lincoln took a train down on April 4th, 1865, and walked around Richmond. Uh, crowds of African Americans greeted him as Messiah and, uh, you know, wanted to, to touch him. Uh, in uh, one particularly moving moment, Lincoln told one Freeman, don't kneel to me. You must kneel to God only and thank him for the liberty you will enjoy hereafter. But it was a, it was a gutsy move on Lincoln's part because there were obviously Confederates that, that would have killed him. Indeed, of course, they uh, did later on. Realizing uh, that his situation was desperate in Appomattox Courthouse, Lee began a correspondence with Grant on April 7, 1865. To the left is the original draft of Grant's surrender term sent to Lee, which was preserved by one of Grant, Grant's staff. So Lee sent out a messenger saying he wanted to, wanted to negotiate. There was some negotiation in letters, and then they agreed to meet. Grant and Lee agreed to meet on April 9, 1865 at Wilmer McLean's uh, farmhouse. And Wilmer Clayton, it's kind of funny, was actually a guy living in uh, Manassas, Virginia, where the battles of Bull Run had taken place. And he'd uh, previously fled there because he wanted to get away from the war. And he went to southwestern Virginia and settled in Appomattox. Well, now the war's literally going to end in his uh, front parlor. Lee showed up first and he had his uh, finest uniform on. Grant was a bit uh, later and was kind of in, his, in tatters in a hurry. And they exchanged exchanged pleasantries for a while because, again, they knew and respected each other before uh, Lee said to Grant, you know, they needed to get down to signing the agreement and talking about the terms they'd, uh, they'd previously corresponded about. Grant was very generous in his terms. He uh, allowed Lee's men to leave. He didn't put them in a prison of war camp and even allowed them to uh, take their guns because they'd need those to, to hunt. And uh, if they had horses, they could take them. Uh, all they really had to do was uh, promise not to take up arms against the United States again. And uh, Lee asked if there's, his men were near starvation, and Grant even Lee, agreed to uh, have some of the food delivered to him. Here's some Union troops waiting outside of Wilmer McLean's farmhouse uh, while Lee surrendered inside April 9, 1865. Lee uh, returned to his army and uh, 
he bid them a, a farewell. Here's uh, Lee's farewell to his army. And, uh, you know, they were undoubtedly uh, exhausted and, and but still sad, obviously. When news of Lee's surrender hit Washington and the rest of the world by telegraph, there was a, a big celebration. You can see here, 200 guns will be fired on the on the campus Martis, uh, three o'clock today, April 10th. Uh, you know, it, it was a, just a huge celebration in, every, in a lot of towns. Grant had allowed Lee, his officers and their men to leave Appomattox and Lee was escorted by a Union guard to Richmond where a friend let him stay in his in his house. You can see the house here. And, uh, you know, he was kind of under house arrest while they decided what to do with him. But uh, here's a picture of Lee on his back porch at this house with his two sons after his surrender. And uh, you can see that they're all still in their Confederate uniforms. They really didn't have much of anything else. Grant returned to Washington on April 13, 1865, as victory celebrations followed the arrival of the news of Lee's surrender, as I say. Later, uh, in late May, there was a grand review of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, right down Pennsylvania Avenue, and that's what you can see here, but that was a little bit later in uh, late May. Sporadic fighting continued in parts of the South uh, after Lee's surrender, but mostly Southerners realized that the war was lost. Lost. Many African Americans were not even aware of the Union victory. After federal forces arrived in Texas in June 1865, the Union commander issued military orders, which you can see on the right, on June 19th, and uh, that enforced freedom for the slaves there. And this became the uh, basis for the celebration of Juneteenth. The Civil War was, of course, the most deadly in American history. Here you can see that there were well over 600,000 casualties. Now, you know, that that may not sound like a whole lot, but you got to keep in mind that the nation was uh, less than a tenth the size it is today. There were only 31 million people in both the North and South combined. On April 14th, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, Lincoln's wife, wanted to relax, and she prevailed upon uh, Abraham Lincoln to go to the theater, and the, the theater was in Washington, Ford's Theater, which you can see here. Uh, Lincoln and his wife invited Grant and his wife, but Grant, as I say, had just returned from Washington and begged off. They invited several others before uh, uh, a major, Henry Rothbone, and his sister, I mean his sister, his fiance Clara Harris, who was the son of a a U.S. senator agreed to accompany them, and uh, at one point uh, later on, that uh, Mary Todd Lincoln said she had a headache, and they almost begged off themselves. Imagine what happened had they they not gone. The play that night was the uh, comedy *Our American Cousin*, starring the uh, famous British actress Laura Keene, and here you can see a flyer for it. The media had mentioned that uh, Lincoln was going to attend, and so it was, it was well known. And uh, you know, among the people that were aware of it was the famous actor John Wilkes Booth, shown here. And Booth was uh, one of the famed actors of his day on the stage. He's, you know, we have famous actors today. He was one of them. Everybody knew him, and so he figured he had, uh, you know, nobody would question him. He could come and go, and nobody would suspect anything. He was actually part of a, a Confederate sort of Secret Service plan earlier to kidnap Lincoln and members of his administration and to bring them back to Virginia during the war and exchange them for prisoners of war. But now that the war was over with, obviously that, that idea died out. But Booth was so ticked off that he and some other co-conspirators decided that rather than just kidnap him uh, for ransom, they were, they were going to kill him. And so what Booth did was he uh, he he planned it for April 14th when when Lincoln attended the theater and uh, he knew all the theater really well and he uh, had a guy hold his horse out back the guy later was accused of being part of the conspiracy but always claimed he was just holding a famous actor's horse that asked him to but Booth had a drink in a nearby bar uh, Lincoln came into the uh, play. Uh, after the play had begun, and the play uh, was going, everybody stopped and cheered for Lincoln. It, after he'd gone up the stairs on the side into a, a private presidential box with with a door, and uh, anyway, uh, uh, Booth knew all this and was waiting for the right time. Here you can see the presidential box at the time of the murder. Note the picture of Washington and the the flag draped for the president. <laughs> 
Ford's Theater is, of course, an historic landmark today, and you can uh, see the inside of it today. They still have it draped with, uh, as it was when, when, when Lincoln was there. The Lincolns had a guard outside their their private booth, uh, and uh, you know he was gone. And and uh, John Wilkes Booth uh, waited till there was applause and quietly opened the door, and came in and and then pulled out a revolver and shot Lincoln in the back of the head. Uh, Lincoln and Mary Todd were were, were actually had just corresponded, I mean just just talked, and they were they're holding hands. Uh, Major Rothbone jumped up and wrestled with John Wilkes Booth, and Booth pulled out a knife and s swung at uh, Major Rothbone and then jumped over the edge of the, uh, the box. He landed on the stage awkwardly and broke his uh, leg, and he stumbled up and he said, Six Semper Terranus, which is the motto of Virginia. Uh, that's what people believe, he said. And he, uh, he, it, it's thus ever to tyrants is what it means in Latin. People initially thought it was, uh, you know, part of the play or something. And uh, eventually they realized what happened and, and pandemonium broke out. Uh, Booth, who knew the stage, quickly escaped out the back and got on his horse and took off during the, the pandemonium. Booth had some conspirators. And uh, the, the plan was that while he killed Lincoln, uh, another uh, conspirator named Lewis Powell, shown here, would attack Secretary of State Seward at his home. Well, Powell went through with the attack. He uh, entered the home, but uh, they ended up wrestling with Seward, and they severely injured him, but Powell didn't kill uh, Seward. Seward survived. Another conspirator, George Atzerodt, you can see him here, his job was to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson, but uh, he he didn't, and uh, and so he's he was not involved that night, but they're going to find out he's part of the conspiracy later on. Lincoln was still breathing when they took him out of the Ford's Theater, and the only place to lay him down was at a boarding house directly across the street. And so they put him in a back bedroom, and you can see a picture of that bedroom there. Here's the boarding house today, and it's, uh, it's right across the street from Ford's Theater, and the tourists are there. You can go visit it. Lincoln was so tall, he couldn't fit in the bed, so they had to uh, lay him down diagonally. And uh, all the, all, you know, the leading figures of the government came, and uh, including the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, and uh, Lincoln's wife, Mary Todd, was historic, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, hysterical. And there on the early morning hours of April 15th, after, you know, a night of heavy labor breathing, Lincoln passed away. Edwin Stanton reputedly said, now he is uh, a man for the ages. Here's a picture of the bed where Lincoln died, and you, it was taken just after his death, and you can see the, the blood-stained pillow still. Stanton took charge and uh, quickly ordered a lockdown of Washington to catch, to catch the conspirators. It didn't take long to figure out that Booth was one of them, and they had some ideas you know, the, of, about the others, of course, and so there was reward uh, placed on all their heads. Booth was able to cross the Anacostia River out of Washington, and now it's, you know, there had already been guards placed on the river, but Booth was a famous actor, you know, so he showed up, and the guards said, well, you know, he didn't kill Lincoln, and, and let him through, and once he was passed uh, that over the river, he was in Maryland, and he started heading southward. Now, he must have been in incredible pain with that broken leg, and he stopped at a, a local physician, Dr. Uh, Samuel Mudd, shown here, and Mudd let him spend the night and set his leg. There is a lot of debate about whether Mudd knew what Booth had just done or whether he was uh, just a, a, Confederate cons uh, a Confederate secret agent, uh, a sort of a secret service that had worked with Booth before the war. They, they didn't know whether he actually knew of the murder assassination, I mean the assassination attempt. Meanwhile, on uh, April 21st, 1865, they uh, started a, a, a train procession carrying Lincoln's body back to Springfield, Illinois. And the train went from Washington northward through major cities and then westward to Illinois. And in every town, it would stop. And along the way, people would stand out and, you know, stand along the tracks and uh, and honor the president. Here you can see the, the you know, the train draped uh and it's uh you know and 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 the ceremony i don't know i'm not sure what city this is
the body would, would lie in state, and they weren't supposed to take pictures. Uh, this is reputedly uh, one picture that somebody took kind of illegally. It's the only picture of uh, Lincoln after his, after his death, and, it's in his, and he's obviously in his casket. Booth had made it across uh, the river into Virginia, but there on April 26, 1865, he was cornered in a farmhouse. You can see a picture of the farmhouse there. He was actually in a guy's tobacco barn sleeping when the troops found him. Uh, he refused to surrender, and, and there was fighting, and the barn was set on fire, and, and he died. They brought him to the porch, and he reputedly, one of his last words was, useless, useless. We're not quite sure what that means. Lincoln's train made it to Spring, Springfield, and uh, there he was buried in, uh, on May 4th, 1865, and you can see the crowd depicted there and, and the uh, burial place today with its monument in the back. Here was a, a death mask of Lincoln made after he died. On May 10th, 1865, which was obviously after Lee's surrender and Lincoln's assassination, among other events, uh, Jefferson Davis was finally captured at a campsite in Georgia. You can see some of the news of Jefferson Davis capture. Not one, sh not one shot was fired. Uh, Davis tried to make a quick dash towards a nearby creek, and in the process had thrown on his wife's overcoat over his shoulders, and that then led to a rumor that he'd attempted to flee in women's clothing. In time, there was a popular song of there that was, you know, Jeff in petticoats. Uh, and all, there are a lot of major tabloids that featured artists' rendition of the fallen leader dressing everything from a wig to a hoop skirt, and you can see some of those here. Jefferson Davis was transported to Fort Monroe, uh, Virginia, located in Hampton Roads, and he, he, they allowed his, his wife and uh, family to join him, and he, it, wasn't a, it wasn't that harsh a confinement, but uh, he's going to be there for, for two years. A military tribunal began a seven-week trial of uh, eight accused co-conspirators in mid-May 1865. The defendants, uh, like Mary Surratt and some of the others, claimed they didn't know about the assassination attempt. Uh, you know, there was there was even some debate that they had been part of a Confederate Secret Service attempt to uh, cat kidnap the Lincoln and, and Johnson and so forth and exchange them for prisoners before the war ended. But they didn't know. They said about you know the uh, the the plan to kill Lincoln afterwards. Uh, Mary Surratt just said she was you know owner of the boarding house where it had taken place. But anyway, on on June 30th, 1865, uh, the four were convicted and sentenced to hanging. Others like Samuel Mudd, who always claimed his innocence, said he didn't know uh, that Booth had just killed Lincoln. He he was they were they were sentenced to prison. Besides Powell and Atzerodt, the other two co-conspirators co sentenced to death were David Harold, and he's shown on the left, who helped Booth escape, and Mary Surratt, who's shown on the right, a woman who owned the boarding house where the plot was hatched. On July 7, 1865, the Booth co-conspirators co were hanged in the uh, yard of a military arsenal in northeast Washington, and you, here you can see a picture of it. If you look closely on the left, you can see they're holding an umbrella, and that was because Mary Surratt was a woman, and they're protecting her from the sun right before she got hanged, which is kind of silly. And here's the, here they are after the uh, plank would pulled out, and they they had died. Davis, meanwhile, was indicted for treason. A, a jury was impaneled, and a trial. Uh, however, never took place because increasingly people feared that a conviction and execution would sort of hinder reconciliation and restart the fighting of the war. They also feared that a jury might acquit him on the idea that secession was constitutionally legal, which would cause all sorts of problems. Eventually, President Andrew Johnson, who of course had seceded Lincoln, uh, and by the way, who was a southerner open to leniency to the South, gave a blanket pardon to the leaders of the Confederacy, uh, Davis and Lincoln alike. Uh, shown here is a newspaper article with Congress voting for a trial. After years of financial problems, Jefferson Davis finally died in uh, December 1889. Here he is as an old man in a newspaper article annou announcing his death. When Davis died in 1889, his funeral in New Orleans was attended by thousands. By the time of Davis's death, a lost cause ideology had begun to grow in the defeated South. 
It endorsed the supposed virtues of the Annabelle himself and viewed the war primarily as a struggle to save a noble way of life and states' rights against an overwhelming and corrupt federal government. De-emphasizing or completely ignoring the institution of slavery, the lost cause cast the South as noble and its leaders as exemplars of chivalry. They were smarter militarily and more courageous than the people in the North, and the South only lost because it faced overwhelming numbers and in industrial strength. This lost cause celebrated all the South's leaders, but Robert E. Lee sort of became the symbol most notably of the lost cause. The term lost cause uh, came from an 1866 book you can see here published by a Virginia Arthur. The lost cause narrative had begun to grow by the time of Jefferson Davis's death in 1889, but it was a little bit later, around the turn of the century in the early 1900s, when it really gained steam throughout the South. Southerners built, uh, you know, more monuments and named schools and institutions after Southern leaders and in honor of the Southern cause and narrative. In any event, this is the uh, conclusion of the video on the end of the war in 1865.